tend to be where the light and darkness meet on the edge of the horizon through the trees i am a narcissist crippled with self-doubt i've got a courage that brings me to my knees i am equal parts sacred and pro hello hi and howdy how's everyone doing today i certainly hope everyone's doing great if you're new here, welcome. My name is Jenny. It's very nice to meet you. If you are a return visitor, as always, welcome back. If you haven't done so and you get anything out of this content, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment with your thoughts. Today's story is a suggestion from Julia Chastain. And Julia, if you see this, thank you so much for the suggestion. Before we start, I want to give credit where it's due. Much, not all, of the information in this story will come from a documentary, Our Precious Hope Revisited, St. Louis Little Jane Doe, which was directed by Edgar Bird Sosa. Now let's jump in. I want to say that case number 83-29584 is one of the strangest cases I've researched, and not just the death, but the investigation. And not saying that the investigators did not do their due diligence, because they did, or that they didn't properly investigate. Just saying in general, it's just all over the place. I usually begin these stories with the victim's date of birth and a little information about them so we know them as well as we can, but unfortunately at this point it is not possible in this story. The best information available is the approximate birth year is between 1972 and 1975. On the 28th of February in 1983, Two men, identified as Mr. Harris and Mr. Thompson, entered an abandoned apartment building named Domi, which means home or Pearl, apartments located at 5635 Clemens Avenue in St. Louis, Missouri, which is the West End. The building had been abandoned since 1978. There are multiple stories of why the young men were there. Some say that they were there to steal metal to salvage, and some say they were looking for a pipe to work on a go-kart, which is what is said in the documentary, but nonetheless, they were there. Brian McGlynn, who was a sergeant homicide detective, said the two men went into the basement and one lit a cigarette lighter, and when he did, he saw a body lying in the corner. When they examined it closer, they realized that the body didn't have a head. The body was laying stomach down, with her arms tied behind her back with red and white nylon rope, and she was dressed only in a long sleeve yellow sweater. Her fingernails were painted red. The men ran out of the building and called 911. Sergeant McGlynn said that Mr. Harris and Mr. Thompson that found the body were both obviously disturbed by what they saw and are not considered suspects in any way. They were actually just teenage boys. The documentary stated that they couldn't be working on a vehicle as they lived across the street from the building, but honestly, that doesn't mean they didn't enter the building searching for a metal pipe to work on a vehicle, which, according to the documentary, it was a go-kart. Also interviewed was former homicide detective Joseph Bergen. He was one of the original officers on the scene and assigned to the case. He said it was about 1.30 or 2 o'clock p.m. when they arrived on the scene. When he arrived, he said a crowd had already gathered. On top of the many officers, neighborhood residents, and the media were present. Detective Bergen said that they began knocking on doors to ask questions. It wasn't a good neighborhood then. The detective said that it was riddled with drugs and prostitution. In fact, they first thought that is what she was. There was another apartment building next door to the building where Jane Doe was found. There was a woman there who ran a candy store. And there was a park um, just a few blocks away. So there was a lot of activity in this neighborhood, yet no one seemed to know who the young victim could be. The crime scene photographers and technicians also arrived to take evidence. The detectives did not enter the room of the building, that, which was the furnace room, that the body was located in until the crime scene investigators completed their part of the investigation. When the detectives entered the room, they saw a trail of blood from where the perpetrator carried the body in. They believe the body was brought in after her life was taken. They don't believe it happened there. The medical examiner was then brought in. The medical examiner found bruising on her neck, so they believe the assailant choked her prior to decapitating her. Also, they believe that not a lot of time passed between her death and when she was dumped. 
semen was found on the outside of her body. There was a single hair found on her body. A search ensued at this point to find the little girl's head. Missing persons was also checked and nothing was found. Officer Bergen said that they started calling around to see if anyone matched the description, but honestly, what description? She was headless. The detectives then went to the medical examiner's office and talked to a forensic anthropologist who said that her age was believed to have been between 8 and 11 years old. She weighed 60 pounds. Without her head, she was 4 foot 10 inches tall, so they believed with her head that she would have been between 5 foot 3 and 5 foot 4, which is tall for her age. The full autopsy was conducted by Dr. Mary E. Case on the 1st of March in 1983 at 8.30 a.m. It was determined that there was no scarring on the body to suggest she was abused. There was no food in her stomach. She was fingerprinted and her feet print were also taken. It is also believed that a long serrated blade was used to remove her head. There was also green paint found on the body. The sweater she was wearing didn't look like it had been worn out, and it had creases that appeared that it had been folded. Mold was found in the area of the neck that had been cut. The mold was sent to the Missouri Botanical Gardens. They were to grow the mold to try to develop a timeline, and it took four to five days. An independent forensic pathologist, Dr. Joy Carter, reviewed the autopsy report from the documentary and said that due to posterior tear, it appeared she had been essayed, and due to hemorrhage, she believed that this happened prior to her losing her life. She said the autopsy described the decapitation first, but in her opinion, it should have been described last as it was post-mortem. She felt the emphasis should have been on the strangulation and the essay. She said the autopsy did state that there was a white hair that was found on the child. She said the autopsy also described aspirated blood, which tells her that there was something that happened to the head area, such as punching, fractures of the bone, such as the cartilage in the nasal bone, that would have caused the blood to go through the nasal passages into the respiratory tract. She said this child was injured prior to losing her life, and it was violent. She agreed with the size it is suggested the victim would have been if measured correctly. She mentioned the autopsy of Tupac and said when his autopsy was done, he was measured from the tip of his toe to the top of his head. And that is what was done in this situation also, and it makes the victim appear taller. This means if she was measured from her heel up to the top of her head, she would be reduced by five or six inches, which would make her height between four foot nine and five feet, which would be in line with the average height of an eight to an 11 year old child. Dr. Carter said that what was shocking about this case is the brutality of what was done to a young child. She said she could imagine the strain on the chest and the rib cage from her hands being tied tightly behind her back. She said she believed someone removed this child's head to hide her identity. Per Detective Bergen, they started contacting schools in the area to see if any children were missing from school. They learned that due to a budget crisis, the schools didn't have secretaries, so there was no one on staff to track children if they were transferred from one school to another. They contacted the school board office as they were computerized. They learned who was not attending, so they would continue calling around school to school to try to learn who had transferred and where they transferred to. It wasn't online, so they literally had to call each school, and if they were told where they transferred here, they would have to call the other school. And there were several schools in the area, so it was a process. Officer Bergen said that once they located the children in St. Louis, they moved to surrounding areas. Captain William Relling with the Juvenile Division stated that they went through the school absentee records and did not come up with anything. They started getting calls of people thinking that it could be one child or another. They were checking each lead and they still come up empty handed. Within seven months of the discovery of the child, the detectives had accounted for every eight to 11 year old black female enrolled in St. Louis schools in neighboring districts. Tyrone Dennis, a retired gang detective from Atlanta, Georgia, said an informant reached out with information. He said initially law enforcement felt it wasn't relevant. He got with CORE, which is an acronym, C-O-R-E, Congress of Racial Equality. 
A sting was set up with undercover detectives. The informant requested $900 for the information, and he was denied. Core did interview the informant and paid him $600 for the information. He told the investigator that the head of the body could be located in Waterloo, Illinois, hanging from a tree. The entire area was searched, and the head was never located. The informant gave a seven-hour interview, but it was discovered later that the information that he gave was a lie. And why do people do that? Each state in the United States was sent a letter describing the victim. Now, remember, back then they weren't online. They received no response. They looked for missing person cases with similarities and still came up empty-handed. Homicide Captain L. Atkins started making appearances at community meetings. At the temple on Del Mar, he said, quote, Somebody out there knows something. Talk to your neighbor. Talk to your friends. Somewhere out there is a mother without a little girl, a brother without a sister, a neighbor without a little girl walking down the street. End quote. On a Sunday, just a few weeks after the body was found, a public memorial service was held at New Mount Gideon West Baptist Church. Yet the little girl, who the press was now calling the sweater girl, and authorities referred to as Little Jane Doe, laid unclaimed for months at the morgue. Captain Adkins believed that the parents of this child would surely show up, so he delayed her burial for over nine months. Then a funeral was held at the Woodson Funeral Home at 1167 Avenue, St. Louis, Missouri, on the 2nd of December in 1983. She was buried at the Washington Park Cemetery. Four workers for the funeral home carried the casket. In attendance was Captain Adkins, Jesse Woodson, who conducted the funeral, Baxter Leisure, the medical examiner, and Joe Bergen, one of the homicide investigators, and a few photographers. And that was all. No one else was there. Her little casket was made of white wood. The ceremony lasted approximately five minutes. And how heartbreaking. Mary Schaefer and her husband owned the Schaefer Monument Company. Mary watched the burial on the news, and she wanted to donate a grave marker for this child. They left a place to add a name if she was ever identified. On the marker, quote, The saddened hearts were healed in knowing the pain of life is over and the beauty of the soul is revealed. Detective Bergen said that every year on the anniversary of the beginning of the case, an all-points bulletin was put out. In 1985, VICAP was created. It was to look into unusual violent crimes and was a criminal apprehension program. And the story of Jane Doe St. Louis, a.k.a. Sweater Girl, was the first case entered in Missouri and still no hits. She was also entered in NamUs. In 1990, Detective Bergen appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show to discuss the case and still no hits. In May of 1992, police officer Anthony Umbertina was speaking to Danny Davis at the storage unit on St. Charles Rock Road. He was a skull collector and had a skull in the storage shed. It was taken and sent to the Armed Forces Pathology to have it looked at, but it was a male. In 1994, the St. Louis Police Department was contacted by the television show Sightings. The psychic for the show, Noreen Reiner, wanted the evidence found to be sent to her so she could get mental images from them. The sweater and the rope were both sent to her. They never received the items back, and when contacted, the psychic stated that she sent them back. Many believe to this day that Noreen kept the items, However, Sergeant McGlynn said he saw the receipt where she mailed them and they were signed for by another deputy at the department. On the 26th of October in 1999, the building where the body was discovered was demolished. In 2001, Sharon Nolte of Kansas City spent over $20,000 of her own money to investigate this case. She believed the victim was not black but Native American. She believed that she was the missing girl, Shannon Johnson, but DNA proved this is incorrect as well. Ron Henderson, former chief of police for the St. Louis Police Department, wanted to pursue isotope testing. 
This type of analysis can provide leads by narrowing down possible geographic regions from which a person has traveled or has lived. In 2009, detectives contacted the Smithsonian Institution and they said they would do the testing on the remains at no cost. In 1991, Virginia Younger, the owner of the cemetery, took her own life. She was being sued as the cemetery had fallen into disarray and the records that were kept were not accurate. This made locating the grave of Jane Doe a task. Bodies were missing from graves and some buried on top of other bodies. Bones were literally found above the ground amongst the trash and debris. This poor little girl just can't catch a break. When they located the headstone and they exhumed the remains, it was discovered that there were three different bodies buried together, but none were her. The headstone was on the wrong gravesite. Like how? Dr. Michael Graham of the St. Louis Medical Examiner's Office didn't believe a better DNA sample than the one that they already had on file would be possible and declined to authorize another dig unless they could verify the exact location of the grave. The Assistant Director of Computer Science at St. Louis University received a photograph from the funeral of Little Jane Doe with an article of what they were attempting to do. She said she needed to figure out where the camera was located when it took the photo to locate the remains. She contacted Calvin Whitaker, the owner of Michael's Funeral Home. He was helping with the cleanup efforts at the Washington Park Cemetery. She would then travel to the cemetery to compare the landmarks in the photo to the landmarks in the cemetery. But when she got there to try to figure out where the photographer was standing when he took the photo, she realized that by 2013, many of these things had changed since this photo had been taken. She got it down to a five-foot estimate of where she believed the photo had been taken. Her remains were located and she was exhumed. Samples were extracted from her remains and sent to several institutions, including the Smithsonian. The stable isotope analysis that was done at the Smithsonian Institute revealed that Jane Doe was not originally from St. Louis, but possibly spent most of her childhood in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, or Minnesota. The University of North Texas, however, concluded that also she was not from St. Louis, but they believed that she spent most of her childhood in Louisiana, Tennessee, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, or Florida. Following the testing, her body was once again prepared for burial by Michael's funeral home. She received a new casket, this time with angels on the corners. She was buried this time in a pink and white checkered dress. She was buried on the 8th of February in 2014. Judge Rebecca Navarro McKelvey, who was the president of the Garden of Innocence, gave little Jane Doe a name. She named her Precious Hope. This time she received a real funeral. She even had bagpipes and the service lasted over an hour. The St. Louis Police Department began working with the Parabon Nano Labs to attempt to discover the genealogy of little Precious Hope. This type of testing is world renowned for its facial reconstruction using only DNA. Unfortunately, due to her age, this wasn't an option. The DNA samples that were collected did manage to rule out many people, however. This post, titled Trying to Find Missing Sister, by a poster named Finding Janetta on the website Reddit, popped up. In it, the author writes she and her older sister had different fathers and lived with their maternal grandmother after their mother went to jail in 1981. The poster says she remembers her sister's father picking her up just after New Year's in 1983 and never letting her or her mother ever see her again. Other specific details from the post include a birth date of May 15, 1973, which would have made her nine years old at the time she last saw her sister and within the eight to 12 year old age range, forensic experts believe the remains fall. A possible name, Janetta Brooks. References to the little girl's father having ties to Terre Haute, Indiana and St. Louis. 
relatives of the child's father confirming that they haven't seen the child since Valentine's Day in 1983 either. The level of detail that is contained within this post, um, there seems to be a fair amount of information that could potentially fit with the information that investigators already know. But whoever finding Janetta is has gone dark. As of today, the true identity of little Jane Doe, a.k.a. Precious Hope, has not been discovered and her head has never been found. If you have any information that could help give this little girl back her identity, please contact the St. Louis Police Department at 866-371-TIPS or email homicidecoldcases at stlpd.org. Well, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, that brings us to the very end of what we know about Precious Hope. And Precious, whoever you really are, rest easy, baby girl. Rest easy, honey. You are free, and you deserve your identity back. If you got anything out of this content, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment with your thoughts. If you know somebody else that might be interested, please share this content. If you have a case suggestion, please email me at jenny period elisa period at gmail.com and until the next video toodles I'm equal parts.